The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. pray. We've been doing some things on hearing God more clearly, but uh, interestingly enough, I had a hard time hearing from God what he wanted me to teach on when it was hearing from God, all right? So I says, he must be trying to teach me something here, to hear more clearly. Well, then I recognized that in 42 years of ministry, there's still the pressure to hear from God for two messages a week minimum, you know, and so Saturday, I still didn't know what I'm preaching for today. And so I said, I know I'm not going to even remotely try. I stayed in the presence of God for six hours with no demands or expectations. There's a message in that. No demands or expectations. Six hours going, my hope is in God. And he's never disappointed me in 42 years. I've never not had a message. I mean, even logically, I've never not had a message. So, and it was such a a place of bliss, but a more implicit trust. I heard someone say God's dealing with them about a more implicit trust, to trust him at a deeper level than before. That's healthy because that's foundational. I like anything that's foundational. Trust is foundational. But, so I'm going, so God, what are you saying? And he's saying, that basically what I was doing was hoping in him and him alone. So the message is hope. How's that? Well, I, see, I got the message. I, if you do what's right, <laughs> you will know. So basically today's message is hope as the neglected virtue. Say that back to me. Hope is the neglected virtue. You've heard sermons on faith. you heard sermons on love. How many of you heard on hope? The only ones I heard, I preached. <laughs> huh? But hope is a neglected virtue, and hope needs to be understood. And so I want to kind of start out with under, understanding the way it is in the world, and then we're going to bring it into the spirit realm. But in the world, uh, uh, we talked before that there's like moods. Emotions and moods are different, right? You know that. Emotions can be a couple seconds, and they change. Um, just like the weather in Florida or something. You know, one minute sun's out, next minute it's rain. All right, emotions are like that, but moods are kind of like a weather pattern that lingers. And unfortunately, even believers say this will pass. That is a major mistake. Don't wait for a mood to pass. Change the mood. All right? But most people do have a tendency to just wait it out like this will go. So I want to cover the moods just briefly, just so that you, you can get up to speed. But like in the, uh, in the Greek verbs, uh, there's four moods, the indicative, the imperative, the subjunctive, and the optative. Oh boy, you all know what those are, right? Indicative, imperative, subjunctive, optative. All right, now let me just show you in simple language what this is like. Only I'm going to spiritualize it. I'm going to bring it into my experience in the kingdom. I was born again in the early 70s, and here's what happened. The sky was blue and the grass was green. Now that's the indicative mood, spiritually. I never saw such a blue sky and grass was never so green. And I love God, and God loved me, and I was pretty sure everyone else would love me too until I started giving the preaching the gospel to them, whether they wanted to or not. And the mood gradually started to change from the sky is blue and the grass is green and I love God and God loves me, and to where I started to beat them over the head with the Bible because they weren't all taking it in. You don't understand, you need this. The mood changed from the indicative to the imperative. It was like in your face, Bible over the head. Follow me? Huh? What would we call that in the flesh? Just pushy. <laughs> but I, 
I was only giving them what they needed, the gospel. I was only beating them over the head with good stuff, right? And what happens after you push long enough? People push back. Oh, did it hurt your feelings? If you care. <laughs> and it'll hurt your feelings and then you go into the subjunctive mood where you start to weigh the pros and cons of this Christian life here and you can stay in any of these moods for a long time you can stay pushy pretty much until you get burned out that's where burnout comes from you are pushing Christianity you are not being led by the spirit you are pushing your agenda of religion on people how many can tell when you're pushing? How many can tell when someone else is pushing? Does anyone ever talk to you and you feel like going like this while they're talking? They're probably pushing, and that is a spiritual perception, believe it or not. Your spirit picks that up. That's not just body language. That's something you can feel. All right. So then, in this uh, indicative mood, you had this great hunger for God. Everything was great. Oh, man. But then... You found out that this is real and vital, but people aren't taking it in. Disappointment and discouragement starts to settle in, and you start getting more cautious about talking. Like, for one of the first healings I prayed Jennifer through when we got married was she was in an abusive relationship where she just believed that talking only makes it worse. So then you kind of clam up, but that's not healthy. That's a lack of communication. You can't have a good relationship if you don't talk. Communication is key. Matter of fact, Jesus said 15 times in the New Testament, you know, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. You've got to be to learn to be a listener, and you've got to learn to communicate. Most of life is 80% communication one way or another, so you might as well learn to do it, right? You can't write it off. But if you get in that subjunctive mood, it's a perilous hour because it could get you into a route to where you weigh out the pros and cons. And whenever you're in that negative mood, the, the, the pros are a very short list and the long list are why bother. And then depression sets in and a heaviness. And you can move in a cloud of heaviness for a long time. And you can see, you meet people, even Christians, that have that heaviness lingering on them. They go, hi. Even when they smile, it feels like there's a, a weight upon them. All right? And, but lastly, even in the natural, even in, even in the flesh, there's the opportunity for a change called the optative mood. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The optative mood means even though I feel like garbage and I feel like there's a weight on my neck, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. I can see it. <laughs> if I just focus toward that light, I can get past this. And that's actually healthy. That's actually healthy. Don't go by how you feel at the moment. Go for the light. The light at the end of the tunnel. All right? Now, you kind of get the idea of those four words, not what they mean, basically. Life is great. Then you get pushy. Then people find out everybody, I found out everyone didn't love Dennis. I couldn't understand that. I love God. God loved me. Why didn't everybody else love me? Well, mainly because I was a little verbal, and I'd read their mail and found out sometimes that wasn't wisdom. It's not a when. It, reading people's mail is not a good way to win friends and influence people. And you need to see if God really wanted you to say what you said. I was operating under a biblical principle, though, sowing and reaping. If I give what I have, I get more. So I just gave everything I had whether they could handle it or not. And then I could receive more. And then God said, okay, now, truth number two. It's called wisdom. Wisdom is to know when to do and when to say. Oh, brother. That put a great limitation on my pushiness. Now, the optative mood. And here's the key. In Hosea 2, verses 14 and 15, if we're going to understand this message on hope. Remember, you've heard messages on faith, you've heard messages on love, but you very rarely hear it on hope. And these three are going to remain. Isn't that what it said in Corinthians? Faith, hope, and love, these three. These, things, these three things are great, and we should know what is great about it and how 
to appropriate it. So Hosea 2.14, it says, In the valley of Achor, which means trouble, God has a door of hope. This is what we want to turn around today. We want you to take everybody's trials and tribulations and everybody in this room and everybody watching in your lives. But there is a door of hope even in the midst of your trouble. One of the things that sustained me as a young believer was that knowing that on the other side of this trouble was, could be my greatest anointing. Hmm? To this day, I believe my strongest anointing is spiritual acceptance, acceptance that I got from God. I belong, and because I belong, I got a lot to give. And that's not arrogance, that's a healthy God confidence, not self-confidence, God confidence. I belong, and because I belong, I've got a lot to give out of that union and communion, not out of anything that I have to offer in my flesh. It's valueless. But knowing that I have been joined together with Him, that it's in Him I live and move and have my existence. So uh, this new mood is understanding that the mood of hope. And here's another thing too. You hear stuff about open doors and closed doors. Well, if it's an open door, it's easy. You know, it's a closed door. I want to remind you of a scripture because hope will get you past uh, obstacles. It'll get you through uh, difficulties. It'll cause you to rise above. But here's a scripture I want you to ponder. 1 Corinthians 16, 9. Now we already said Hosea 2, 14 is what? Your valley of trouble could be a door of hope. All right. Your valley of trouble can be a door of hope. But in 1 Corinthians 16, 9, this is, to me, he was in the optative or hopeful disposition of heart when he said this. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16, 9, a great and effective door has been opened unto me. And there are many adversaries. What do most Christians do when there's adversaries? Withdraw, retreat, don't try, don't risk it. See, that's not about open door, closed door. He saw spiritually God's got a commission for me and there's going to be resistance. But the optative mood, the mood of hope in God and obedience to that God was greater than, and there are many adversaries. That's simply not living in denial. That's simply saying there's many adversaries. There's going to be obstacles to overcome. But this is a great and effective door. As a matter of fact, I'm going to stay here a year. And there are many adversaries. That needs to be cultivated in the believer's heart and life. Do you agree? We need that kind of hope. That's supernatural hope, right? That's to where you're not entrapped by circumstances or people. You're steadfast in circumstances, patient with people, with joy. We're going to have the Makarios in this church. We're going to have a life joy that is enviable, that functions independent of circumstances. But we've got to learn how to rise above these circumstances. So, all right, now I want to move from, from uh, these moods. Uh, and these moods can be very carnal, but that's a way to understand them. But I can remember as a young believer, I transitioned through these modes. There was times where I was bummed out because I was pushy, and then you get bummed out. And, and I didn't go to work. And I would call up and say, I am sick. And I wasn't sick and I was lying. Then I'd get convicted that I was lying. So I'd hang up and say, sick and tired. Like that justified the lying. And then I'd get convicted that that didn't justify it. Okay. Temper tantrums, meltdowns, negativity. Those have to be removed. Those are mountains. Speak to those mountains and be the removed. There's your faith. What do you need to speak to? You need to speak to that negativity, to those temper tantrums, and to those meltdowns. You shouldn't have them as a mature believer. That should be historical, not current. Are we going to work on that? Seriously, you want to mature? You cannot mature beyond what you, your emotions allow you to, and those are all products of moods are products of undealt with emotions. Emotions don't die, they get buried alive. Any emotion that's undealt with will become a mood over a long period of time. Uh, you can't maintain an emotion long, but you can then catch into from unresolved emotions into a mood, which is like a weather pattern that lingers. You don't want nothing lingering other than life joy, regardless of the outward condition. Okay? So now, 
We're no longer going to live under selfishness, soulish moods, that kind of a mentality or makeup. One died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all, that they which live should no longer live to themselves, but unto him. There's the transition. We're united with him. These old selfish moods got to go. We have a new source now, our new mood, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit, the new creation spirit, not the oldness of the letter. You know, when I got pushy, that's what I was doing, really. I was in the letter of the law, whether I knew it or not. I could have thought I was being very spiritual. But if you get burned out or wore out, you're in the flesh. Because God doesn't wear you out and He doesn't burn you out. Not according to the oldness of the letter, but of the newness of the Spirit, able to live victoriously. Therefore, since we have this ministry, we have received mercy. We don't lose heart. Now, understand this. There are pressures coming, just like Paul said. Ah, a, a great effective door is opened up to me, and there's many adversaries. <laughs> and he's still smiling, even though he's got many adversaries. How many of you smile when there are many adversaries? All right? That's going to be a spiritual condition of hope. His hope was in God, not in an outcome. Oh, if, if the church would get that. I've seen so many, even mature Christians, devastated because they, they're locked into an outcome. They're hoping in an outcome rather than hoping in God and allowing God to bring it to pass as He sees fit. Anyway, that's your free part, but that, that everyone I've ever met needs that one. Now, <clears throat> what does, if hope deferred, what does that do? Makes you sick. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. You shut down and you give up on hope, that's going to happen. You've got to be able to release it now. Our new makeup. We're going to move beyond. We're going to live as a new species, a new creation, uh, a living experience. Okay, now the message. That was a review on moods. <laughs> if you came Tuesday night, you'd have had the whole in-depth teaching on it. What day is Studio Tuesday, Brad? Tuesday. Tuesday. All right. See, these people are fast. All right. All right. So here, here's the here's the key. We're entering into, now I want to speak prophetically to the season we're in, because not only are we writing the book on the Didache, but it's really a clash of cultures in the early church, and we have it now. Anyone that newly comes into the body now is going to be a lot like the Gentiles were to Jewish believers who had a foundation. Jewish believers had the Old Testament. They had morality. They had the Ten Commandments. The Gentiles... All of a sudden, they're coming into contact with Jesus, but their whole value system is going to be turned upside down. Things that they thought, well, everybody does it. All of a sudden, now, these Jewish apostles are calling it sin. Sin? What's that? All right? Now, we're entering into a season of increased strength and influence. And I've already given it to you. Uh, in, in the past two messages. The season that we're in right now is an increase of strength. And God showed me like uh, the abs, <laughs> which to my, I'm, I have some, but they're well hidden. You know, those, did you ever see Roman soldiers with the armor? The abs were always very prominent. Who knows behind that armor what the guy really looked like. But nonetheless, it was kind of fearsome, isn't it? To see the uh, the, the, the broad shoulders and the uh, chest and the abs on the armor. Well, in the spirit, God wants to strengthen you by His spirit in the inner man. Are you going to cooperate with that? Being strengthened by His spirit in the inner man. It comes by revelation. It comes by revelation, but it also comes by experiencing that supernatural strengthening. So we're entering a season of increased strength, and with that strength, it's for the purpose of influence. And it includes a different spirit. It's more like Joshua and Caleb. Yes, we can take the land. But the majority said, oh, there's giants in the land. we got to get back to where Paul said, the effective door is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. Come on, I want to see that kind of excitement when you go to work tomorrow. I'm going to work. God has given me this job and he has 
supernaturally placed me. He has appointed the exact time and the exact place that I should live and, and move and have my work. And there are many adversaries at work. But I'm going to have kratos. I'm going to have dominion, authority. How many are going to go with dominion, authority? Huh? All right. Dominion authority. Now, anyway, uh, we are receiving a spirit of hope, but not as a principle, but a spirit of hope, which is, what's Colossians 1 say? Jesus in us, the hope of glory. Hope is a tangible spirit, and it can be written on the tablet of your heart, because these three things are going to remain. Faith, hope, and love, these three, they will remain. It's tangible, it's spiritual, it's not a mental concept. All right, now, <clears throat> hope doesn't disappoint, unless you want to be disappointed. Hope does not disappoint. If you're in disappointment, I promise you, you're hoping in an outcome instead of hoping in God. You've got strings attached to your hope. Disappointment, hope doesn't disappoint, you're not in hope, then... You know, and, and actually I, I can understand that because, you know, uh, hope has kind of a bad connotation to it. It's kind of like, well, I hope so. Well, I don't think that's going to work. I really don't. I hope it does, but, all right. When we talk hope in the natural, we think in terms of defeat, believe it or not. Well, I hope you do, but, you know, about to be careful. But hope appoints. Now here's the part, you know, you've all learned the armor of God in Ephesians 6, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. I have more revelation on a different scripture as far as understanding armor. I understand it in the how-tos a little bit better in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and hope of salvation as a helmet. I have a better understanding of spiritual warfare with that armor than I do Ephesians 6. By the way, Ephesians 6 is corporate armor. And most Christians are not in a corporate mentality that they are individually part of something bigger called the body or the congregation or the assembly or the church. When I was a baby Christian, God gave me an open vision of how to plant a church. And in that open vision, he gave me four principles, but told me that I believe for such a time as this, I'm going to see the third element. I saw partially glimpses of it. You always get a little taste of it to keep your appetite going. But he said, first of all, Dennis, when you plant that church, you teach them the new creation reality, that they are a new creation. Teach them their identity. And then teach on the gifts, the gifts of the Father, the gifts of the Son, the gifts of the Holy Spirit but primarily encourage them in the gifts of the Father, which are found in Romans. We call them the motivational gifts because everybody has that gift. Even a, even a good evangelical doesn't believe in the other gifts has that gift. And that is to love. And how they love and learning to love their differences, you will then, you will then basically teach them their individual identity and their individual gifting. And then, Dennis, you're going to be patient because you're going to be in ministry many years before you really see the fruition of the third level. And the third level is the corporate identity. Many will never get that far. They will get so stuck on being an individual, but yet, Yet we're coming into a season and a time where God is going to pull out of the scriptures the Ephesian church, the two apostolic prayers. We're in a season where apostolic prayers are going to start getting answered. We're in a season where, in the, did you know that in the book of Ephesians, that the first prayer was that, Father, I bow my knee to the Father in heaven that he would give you and grant you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Hmm? And then secondly, that you would know the love of God, that you would be filled with all the fullness, not only strengthened in the Spirit. Did you know both of those apostolic prayers pertain to a revelation of the corporate church? 
And most of the time you individualize them and just take it for your... Per it has personal application. All scripture has personal application. But the depth of Ephesians and a mature church is going to move into that third level of a corporate identity to where you see that the eye can't say to the foot, I don't need you. That is so desperately lacking. What we see are small, even when people come up to share and I have that, that's a little bit, let it come with a psalm, a hymn, a spiritual song. That is in its minor form something that could be multiplied exceedingly abundantly above that. But not until, think about it, so that you would know what his inheritance is in the saints. Wait a minute. God has an inheritance in you, but he doesn't want your flesh. The only thing you can give him is what he has already transformed in you. Think about it. And he has a corporate body. That is his inheritance. To what degree, and you can only give according to the power that worketh in you, how much power is working in you to decree and declare to display. You know, Ephesians 3 talks about, I'm off topic, but this apparently this is what God wants. Because we're in that season where we're going to get that third level. We're going to get corporate identity. We're going to see the glory of God come and he's going to knit people's hearts together and they're going to understand what knitting Greater and lesser knittings really mean and how to function. People are looking for their niche. That's a wrong approach. Don't look for your niche in the body. Look for loving the body. Look for a revelation of your love for the body and that love will position you properly. Start loving people that is because they're the body. Start serving my first church. They say, Pastor, what's my gift? I'd say, start loving people in the church and I'll tell you what your gift is. I need to see you in action. I need to see you participating. Can you see why the Lord told me? Individual identity, individual gifting, corporate identity. Dennis, you're going to wait for that one. You're going to see small little smidgens of it. And I had, I had four dance teams, four worship teams, four. My, uh, I had mime, dance, drama, you name it. I had flags. Warfare flags, children's flags, children's prophesy. All of that was inside the building. And God says, that is going to change because then that is going to change to where, where they spend 90% of their life. You're going to train them up for that. 90% of their life is not spent inside a corporate assembly. But that training for me was my kindergarten training. And as soon as that became common in the church. I wasn't interested anymore because God was already telling me, you equip them for the marketplace. You equip them for where they live 90% of the time. They've got, to be, uh, they've got to be living there with a makarios, a life joy that is enviable. And to this day, we have still grown into that concept by people whose lives are so changed that other Christians saw the change in their lives and came here. That's discipleship versus conversion. When Christians see a changed transformation in another Christian, they're impressed. And that's still the greatest tool. Because it didn't say go and make converts. It said go ye into all the world and make Talmudim. Disciples. Immersing them in the nature of the Father. Immersing them in the nature of the Son. Immersing them in the nature of the Holy Spirit. That's a whole lot different than baptizing them in water one time and saying, there, I'm done. That's only the beginning. They're not by no means done. So God's basically saying this is a time of hope. Hope is the antidote for despair. And despair will keep you from fitting in and becoming all that God called you to be and all that God called you to do. Hope, your valley of trouble could even be your door of hope. On the other side is an anointing. Messiah in you, the hope of glory. Paul concluded this wonderful hymn, now abide, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. But this helmet, this makes so much sense. He goes on to say in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and hope of salvation as the helmet. The helmet of salvation, actually when you think hope is a helmet, where does all of the problems go? 
where's the dark thinking at? What do you need to do with the little critters? Don't, don't, uh, roaches like the darkness. The little critters like darkness. They gravitate. They love darkness. They don't like light. So if you have the helmet of hope, hope is always looking at the light. Hope is keeping you in the light. Right? It's a product of your spirit, but it's a helmet. And the motivation then is, is love. Faith is now. Actually, you know what? I'm against formulas. But I'll tell you what, this formula actually works spiritually. Faith, which is now, coming from the God in you, the faith of God, plus holding the heart open. By the way, spiritually, I learned hope as open. When I opened my heart, hope deferred. <laughs> I closed my heart. I gave up. I quit. It didn't happen the way I wanted it to happen. I'm mad. I told God how to do it. And he didn't just jump when I told him how I wanted it. So now I'm sick. Because <laughs> hope deferred makes the heart sick. Heart. Does everybody know what I mean with the heart? Raise your hand if you know you've got a good definition of heart in this church. All right. But I'm going to say it for the benefit of those people watching, all right? Everything comes from the heart. You've got to know to be neutral. In the heart means my conscience is clean. That's the voice of your spirit. Four parts. If these four parts, don't tell me you heard from God if these four parts aren't working. My conscience is clean. My mind is sober. Steadfast. disciplined. My emotions are bathed in the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. Peace is love resting. My emotions have the fruit of the Spirit. My conscience is clean. My mind is sober. And my will is held open. It is not in rebellion. Do you... You, how easy it would be to hear from God if you would get neutral? Every one of you. You're his sheep. Most people, when they tell me, God told me this, and, and then I cringe on the inside, it's because one of those four things were in operation in the flesh. They were not neutral. Being neutral. How do I know uh, if I got, okay, I'll deal from a ministerial point of view. I, I got uh, two speaking engagements. They called on the phone. Just because somebody calls on the phone isn't an automatic yes. So I would go, how do I present that to God? Okay, the first one's in Virginia. Okay. My conscience. Am I neutral? Is it clean? Have I forgiven that person in Virginia? <laughs> do I need to? Okay, I did. All right. Ah, huh. I've got peace there. My emotions got peace. Hmm, my mind. I want whatever God wants. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. His ways are higher than my ways. I, I'm pretty sure I'm neutral. Mind, will, emotions, and conscience. All four of those are neutral. Now, God, go to Virginia. You will feel a quickening if it's a yes. There will be an assurance. And your sensitivity is right there. This is not hard. How about... Pittsburgh, uh, uh, I started to lose my peace a little bit, very mild, but I lost my peace. I'm not going to Pittsburgh, but I'm going to Virginia. His ways are higher than my way. Every one of you could do that. You place it before him, but the key to really hearing the voice of God clearly is, am I honestly neutral? If you have an agenda, you will not hear clearly. If you have an idol in your heart, Ezekiel 14.4, they that come to the Lord with an idol in the heart, I, the Lord, will answer them according to the idol in their heart. You're going to hear what you want to hear. I always loved the ones that were, you could discern the lust, but they go, oh, I know God wants me to. I got a peace about it. I got a peace about it. They don't have peace. They got lust. I want what I want, and I want it now, but I've got a peace about it. They use Christianese, but the heart was never neutral. So you all know when I say the heart 
It's your spirit, mind, will, and emotions. All of those pieces must be neutral for you to be in a position where God is working. Okay? Now, back to the message. <laughs> Hope, then, is a disposition. It's a spiritual disposition that says, I have a confident expectation of good. Don't put anything more on the thing. If you're in a situation and you're hoping in God, then have a confident expectation of good. And then don't add or detract from that. Because only God is good. And sometimes good is not God. A confident expectation of good. It's an inner attitude of openness. I, when I learned this, hope and open to me were synonymous. As a matter of fact, uh, I still remember the story in my first pastorate. There was a, a little child in a car seat, and I had just preached on openness. And the mom and the dad were starting to fuss a little bit on the way home, and the little kid in the car seat went, Mom, did you hear the pastor? Open, open, open. <laughs> Out of the mouths of babes, right? Open, open. And they opened up and they resolved the conflict. Uh, open, open, open. Be open to God, open to people. When you put up a wall to people, don't expect God to bless you. I'm sorry. You think you're protecting yourself? You know, it's basically saying... <clears throat> But you can only receive what you're open to. And you know, the promises of God, you cannot stop the promises of God. They're going to go forward, but you don't have to receive them. You can keep from receiving them, but you can't stop them. The promises of God are yea and amen. He's not a man that he would lie. And God wants you to move from corruption to being a partaker of the divine nature. When you escape the corruption that's in the world, you partake. When you partake, you escape. And how do you do that? It says through the promises, these precious, exceedingly great and precious promises. You become a partaker of the divine nature and escape the corruption that's in the world. But you don't have to take the promises of God. You can just wing it on your own or come up with a better idea. But that doesn't, how's that been working for you? <laughs> the, the carnal optimist, and if you're one of these, we want to pray for you. And seriously, today I want you to pray through this soon. If you're watching by Ustream, pray through this because there, we, we run into this all the time. The, what I call the carnal optimist. Never expect anything and you won't be disappointed. That's carnal optimism. That's not very optimistic from the kingdom of God's point of view, is it? That's negative. Never expect anything and you won't be disappointed. Those people live a secluded, restricted life. They don't live life with a capital L in God. Don't expect anything and you won't be disappointed. Then, of course, you got the carnal pessimist. Always expect the worst <laughs> and you won't be disappointed. <laughs> Who wants to live like that? If, that? if that even enters into your thinking, you need a helmet. It's called hope. Seriously, there's critters running around up there, and they're causing havoc. And, and you've got to bring them captive to the obedience of Christ. You've got to get those down here. This is the mind of Christ. This is where his emotions are. This is where his will is. And God wants to will and to work according to His good pleasure. He wants to express His divine nature through you. It's all here, and it will inform this. Where is that hope, anyway? What's Colossians 1.27? Messiah in you, the hope of glory. Ah, okay. Now that I know where He's at, now I know where to go. Faith is to trust in another and you actually believe you're going to be responded to. Now, this goes, this goes for people and God. Trust, putting your trust in somebody, you're hoping that somehow it's going to be responded to. How many know that there's, there's when it comes to people, there's some that you, you can expect them not to respond. If they don't respond, you're supposed to hope in God, not demand that they respond. You demand 
your demand can only be that God will respond. My hope is in God. Because it'll take you down. Hope is believing that what I entrusted with somebody will be responded to. I'll tell you what, you can't do that with all people. But you can live with all kinds of people if your hope is in God. It will navigate you through life with all of the crazies. You can have your crazy uncles and everything and still have a good time at the party if your hope was in God and not in them changing or responding. It'll take you down. Only God can change them. And quite frankly, let's say hypothetical. Let's say, let's do this from a parent point of view. You've got a child. And they're not responding to the way you think they should live their life. Okay? And God all of a sudden sent them on the mission field and they got totally wrapped up in God. They're in the perfect will of God. And they're in a hardship and a place that you would never even see yourself. And they're serving God with all of their heart, but they're not communicating with you. They're in a place where you don't know what's going on. You can't control them. You can't get them to talk to you or respond to you. But they're doing the work of the Lord. Would you be happy? Well, pick on Lisa. Stephen, he loves missions. If he went on the mission field and was serving God with all of his heart, but he was in, say, Iran in an underground church, and he couldn't respond to you for the next five to ten years, but you knew he was serving God and there was no communication, would you be able to live with that? You actually could. See, our hope has to be in God, not in an outcome. The average parent would be very, very upset that they couldn't hear from them. Hmm? Jennifer would be thrilled. She'd be happy because we still want to see our kids serving God, right? Faith plus hope equals love as far as I'm concerned. That's the formula, but faith is now. Hope is I'm holding my heart open to the God of hope. And I really believe love never fails, so somehow love's going to come through, but I can't tell love how to come through. But what I'm holding open, I really believe, will be responded to. But I believe that love never fails. I believe when I failed, as I told love how they had to respond and when. That doesn't work. I belong. And when I released situations like this in my life, the Lord replaced it with I belong, and because I belong, I've got a lot to give. That was a hoping in God rather than an outcome. And when it comes to people, you either reach that person or they can't reach you. So you don't put up a wall, but at the same time, there's no guarantee you're going to reach them because they can put up a wall. But you can hope in God. Nobody can take away your hope except you. Nobody. These three will remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. But these three are going to remain. Some people that don't want to risk it, that's actually inferiority. It's a hope problem. Inferiority is a hope problem. God is a God of hope. Romans 5.5, 5. now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our heart by the Holy Spirit. And Romans 15.13 says, Now may the God of hope 
fill you with all joy and peace. I'm reading my own printing. His own joy and peace. Normally this was typed. <laughs> that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now the next page I made it much bigger. Oh, thank you. So basically what we're going to get into here is I want to minister to this. Hope is the antidote for despair. And, and we need deliver. We need that help of salvation. Hope was the guardian of the mind, the protection against despair, depression, worry, pessimism, anything that is shut up in that dark space. Put on the helmet of hope. I like this one. Here's, here's the Psalm of, Psalm of David, Psalm 42. Why are you in despair, O my soul? Why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. Why are you cast down? We need to talk to our, our soul like that. So what are you depressed about? Soul. Hope in God. Oh, the light at the end of the... Yeah, you give power to what you give attention to. And if you would start to focus at the light at the end of the tunnel, you'd be better off, wouldn't you? Hmm? This gives us access. Why, why would I even want to hope? Well, first of all, when you hope, it brings access to cleanse and to heal. Come on up, Brittany. It enables the Holy Spirit to remove hang-ups that you've had in your heart, emotions that stand in the way. And the fruit of the Spirit gets engrafted. Two scriptures. I want to close with this. Two scriptures. Hebrews 6.18 It's impossible for God to lie. He has strong consolation for those who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before him. I want you to run toward him as a refuge. Run to him as hope. And where is he? Jesus the Messiah in you, the hope of glory. That's the mystery that's been revealed. And he's saying, run to this hope, because this hope we have is an anchor of the soul, sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil. Isn't that beautiful? Hope is the anchor. And, and what's the veil represent? Flesh. But in the Holy of Holies is Jesus, the Messiah in you, the hope of glory. And we're in this season where there's going to be a strengthening. You're all going to have those, those, uh, those really ripped abs in the spirit. You're going to be strengthened by his spirit in the inner man. But the, the attitude or the mood that is going to have to be transferred in your life, we're going to do away with negativity, temper tantrums, and meltdowns. That belongs to baby Christians. If you're still doing that and you've been around for a long time, it's time to put it to rest. It's time to put away the childish things. Negativity, temper tantrums, and meltdowns. And I did them all as a Christian. But I found out that I was missing out on a lot of life because I would let it last for a day or two. It should last minutes. Your Christianity should get back from the garment of heaviness to praise and the optative mood or the mood of hope. So Father, right now, we are asking for forgiveness, for negativity. We're going to put on the helmet of hope, bring light from that hope within. Thank you, Lord. Despair. We curse you once and for all. You're darkness, wrong kingdom. I'm a child of light, coming from the kingdom of light, from the father of lights. I'm a child of light, and I've got the helmet of hope to protect my mind, breastplate of love and faith. Father, I thank you. Despair, you're going to go away. I'm going to go to work tomorrow or school 
or in my home. And I'm going to say whatever obstacles come, God has created an effective open door. And there are many adversaries. God is a God of hope. And like Abraham, who in hope believed against hope. Because you can't stop the promises of God unless you stop them. But a hopeful person is unstoppable. I hope in God. I have a confident expectation of good that all things are working together for the good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. If you want death to negativity, I want you to stand to your feet. Death to temper tantrums. And if you're watching by video, I want you to stand up right where you're at, unless you're driving. <laughs> shouldn't be watching videos and drive anyway, right? But if you're listening, you're listening by CD, I want you to stand where you are right now and say that I'm entering into a new season of spiritual strength. I'm entering into the glory that's already present. And I'm welcoming that King of glory to come in and shine the light. For I'm going to stay focused on that light. And I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to look to the left or to the right. But negativity, temper tantrums, those temper tantrums, it doesn't work. It doesn't get anybody's attention. And it doesn't make you feel any better. It only fortifies your problems. And God, lastly, meltdowns. That's immaturity. Meltdowns mean that I am no spiritually mature more than my emotions are allowing me. Meltdowns are saying emotions ruined me more than Jesus. My emotions have too much power in my life. My emotions belong to God. I was bought with a price. They're not my own. I have no right to suppress emotions and make excuses or rationalizations. My mind belongs to God. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. I'm not smart enough to figure it out. His ways, his will is higher than my will. I'm not smarter than God. So I'm asking for forgiveness and for cleansing right now in Jesus' name that I may hope in the days ahead that I'm going to have laser beam focus on that light even at the end of the tunnel. And that light's going to shine brighter and brighter as the noonday sun, as that, that bright morning star begins to arise in my heart and begins to shine brighter and brighter. You give power to what you give attention to. And I'm giving attention to hope like I've never given it before. And we're praying this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Just give a moment to let that take. I want to absorb the hope that is in me, is in Him. And I am confident that what I'm entrusting to Him, He is able to respond to. If you don't understand the concept thoroughly, just use the word open. Open to God. Open to life. Open to one another. Open, open, open. And I'm not going to shut down because my hope is in God. Love's going to come through. desire is realized, it's a tree of life. I'm remaining attached to the tree of life. Hope is attached. Hope is an anchor behind the veil of my flesh. And it's anchored in the Holy of Holies where 
Jesus, the Messiah in me, the hope of glory resides. And Lord, lift my vision higher. Cause me to dare to look at corporate anointing. Cause me to dare to look at the book of Ephesians, chapters 1 through 3, and see corporateness in it. What is his inheritance in the saints? Is the church. That's not just a bunch of individuals. That's a corporate expression. That's his inheritance is only what he has changed in you. You can't give him your flesh. Only to your love for the church can you offer that to God as his inheritance. His inheritance in you, the congregation, the assembly, the body of believers. Do you see why God said corporate identity? It'll be many years before you see it begin to manifest. You will see smidgens of it, and I have. But God is going to revolutionize the church. And there's going to be corporate identity and corporate gifting. There's corporate gifting that only takes place corporately. <laughs> Rugged individuals never enter into the full dormant gifting that's in them because it's applied corporately. So my suggestion is we start loving one another and seeing how the Lord leads just from something as simple as how you love will begin to cause your gift to make room for you. Then you will fit. Instead of asking, where do I fit? Where do I fit? Why not just start loving and see where it leads you? God will lead you and take you by the way of love every time. So we pray this, seal this work right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. Prepare a body, Lord, for the days ahead to see corporate identity and corporate gifting emerge. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.